my pleasure now to introduce uh, Yona Feinstein, who is going to be talking about Turn It Off and On Again, a short but practical guide to basic technology skills. Yona started his technology career fixing his Bubby's IBM PC in Canoga Park. After that, he was welcoming patrons to the Apple Store and rose through the ranks to Genius Bar. So we have at least one genius here today. He has a master's in education from American Jewish University and specializes in professional development in technology. He spent the last dozen years training teachers in classroom technology at Jewish day schools across LA, managing the help desk at Pepperdine University and creating technology and asset standards in the medical insurance field. And in January, Jonah joined Valley Beth Shalom as our new director of technology. So we welcome you. On weekends, Yona still answers technology questions for his bubby. So, Yona, thank you for joining us, and hopefully you will um, answer all of our quest technology questions that we've had over the years. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Let's, can I take this thing off for now? Recorded, great. I'm going to share my screen like this slideshow. Put it full screen here. Full screen, my presentation. Here, let's make sure this thing works. Okay. Can we see it? We not see it. Why are we giving a hard time? I don't know. One second, we're going to figure this out. Oh, we're good. Okay, wonderful. Hello. Uh, let's move that out of the way. What? We're going to try to figure this out together. We're all learning how this works together. Uh, <coughs> a little bit more to the middle. A little more in the middle. Let me move this microphone here. There we go. Awesome. My name is Yona Feinstein. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with everybody. Um, I've got extensive background in technology and in professional development. Um, I like old gadgets and cooking and big med music and bread and windows. Uh, I dislike kale, hiking, and people who leave time on the microwave. Uh, and yes, I'm married. Sorry, ladies. Mm -hmm. um, I got my BA from UC Santa Cruz. Um, I really wanted to change the way people felt and believed and behaved. Um, so I studied architecture. I studied art history and architecture. So I felt that one day I'd design great buildings that would change the way we, we interact with each other based upon those buildings. And I spent a year um, working as an intern for a big architecture firm and realized I'd never get to touch any of the blueprints. So I decided, well, that, that's not going to work out for me. Let's try something different. Let's look at the way computers change the way we interact with each other. Uh, I spent a year in Israel and then learned how to be a genius trainer. I spent, I worked at the Apple store in 2012. Um, I spent some time between there going to yeshiva and I um, kind of traveled the world and did a bunch of different jobs. Um, this should be 2006. I'm terrible with my dates. The worst Jew at math. Here we go. Um, I started my time at the Apple Store greeting people at the door and understanding how people, um, where are we? Switch back. Come on, come on. There we go. Switch back. And understanding how people came to interact with their own technology. I listened to questions and complaints and uh, people's worries and fears about how their technology was broken at their homes and offered suggestions mostly. Let's get you trained. It's all about learning. These computers are here to help you learn and guide and change the way you behave in the world. They're not here to scare you. That's the biggest thing I learned about. People are always afraid that they're going to touch something wrong. These days, you can't break anything. We'll fix it for you. Because it's all about relationships. I can fix any computer. I can't fix relationships. So that's what we're going to focus on today. Um, I got a master's in education from... Thank you. Thank you, Lois. 
Uh, I got a master's in education from the American Jewish University. Um, in my time at Apple, I was, in my time at Apple, I had a wonderful uh, experience with a prominent Jewish educator named Craig Taubman, who sat down with me and he says, I want to learn how to do computers. I want to learn how to do the MacBook. So I sat down with him and I taught him, and I not only taught him how to use the MacBook, but how to use it in his teaching. And he says to me, we need more people like you in Jewish education. So I got an interview at the American Jewish University, and I, uh, I learned how to become a teacher professionally, and I learned how to use technology in the classroom and how to teach other teachers. Um, I became assistant director of technology at Harkham Academy, and then became a uh, campus technology manager for West Pepperdine West Los Angeles, over the hill by, uh, by uh, Howard Hughes. Uh, last year in 2020, two years ago in 2000, what's been a while, this COVID's killing me. In 2020, I became uh, uh, IT director of Tree Academy, which is a small private school in West Hollywood. Um, and then I became a help desk manager for MedPoint. MedPoint deals with all the relationships between hospitals and medical clinics. Um, and then in 2022, uh, Matt Weintraub calls me and says, I need your help fixing technology of Valley Beth Shalom. And that's how I ended up here. Um, today we're going to talk about Zoom for just a moment. Um, some basic Zoom overview of stuff. Um, hopefully this will be a longer conversation over the next year, years, decades together, about how to do certain technology things. So today we're going to talk a minute about Zoom. Then we're going to talk about a little bit about internet and email safety. And then I'll open it up to some questions. Um, what is this? Um, wow, what is going on? Here we go. Uh, Zoom. Good. <laughs> so in Zoom, the biggest thing to know is your microphone. That's how we communicate with each other. Also your face. You always want to put on a nice face when you talk to people in Zoom. I like to smile. You'll see me smiling, not smiling. You'll see how it changes the feeling. Right here in the bottom, I don't know if everyone can see this right here, over this way, there's a microphone, right? That microphone is how we interact with each other. It's the speaking mechanism. And you'll see it looks like very much like this, like an old style microphone. Good friend Frank Sinatra here is modeling for us. What? So that microphone, it has a little like arrow the there, is. a little, little arrow. You know, how do you when know you that? click it, it shows you all Maya of Eloise the different Stern. audio input. Hold on, hold on. Let me show the mission. To the microphone function. And it looks like this. And if you're having a hard time for, if people are having a hard time hearing you, it might be because you're not, might be because your microphone, the correct one is not selected. So we can see different options here. Same as system or my MacBook Air microphone. That's the one, my MacBook is over here. You may have other ones like Logitech or a Windows microphone. So if people can't hear you, you want to click on the little arrow and then click on the, the next microphone in the option, see if they can hear you after that. Um, you can also go check out your audio settings here. You can test their speakers and see if you can hear things coming out of the speaker system. And you can also see the microphone, you can test it and speak into the microphone and see if the levels are changing. If it's not changing, you might want to click on the microphone option and choose another microphone, see if that works for you. The next thing to look at is the, uh, is this, is the camera at the bottom too. Sometimes the camera won't come on and that is because the wrong camera is selected. If it has the line through it and it says start video, that means your camera is not on. And if it has the stop video, that means your camera is on. Otherwise, it's the, it gives you the option of the opposite. Camera looks something like this. Might be familiar here. And if you click on the little arrow above the camera, you see on here, right over on ours, it gives you different options. I've got two cameras here. I've got snap camera and FaceTime camera. FaceTime is my Apple built-in camera. The snap camera is a different camera filter. Um, and that lets us choose which camera is coming through. You might have Logitech, you might have Windows camera. There are lots of different things we can choose. Um, and then you can also go to the video settings and see how the camera is displayed. See, grumpy face, not so inviting. 
Um, and you can change different aspects about the camera. You can put it on HD, which will make it become a little bit more pretty. Um, you can touch up your appearance. You can change camera settings. And you can also swap the uh, left and right of the camera. You can flip it horizontally. Uh, and it shows here as well that you can go from different um, camera options as well to test that out. And there's always some great recommended practices, right? Mute yourself when you're not speaking. Because if you don't, everyone's going to hear you. And not just what you're saying, the noise in the background too. Um, I worked with Pepperdine for five years running a help desk and running technology for the West Los Angeles campus. There are many times we had workshops for teachers and workshops for guests, and someone would inadvertently forget to turn off their webcam and turn off their camera. I'm uh, sorry, turn off their microphone so to hear conversations from people they didn't necessarily want you to hear, or music in the background, or people who take their cell phone on Zoom into the toilet. It happens. It totally happens. Um, so when you're not speaking, just mute your, mute your microphone. All you got to do is click on the microphone at the bottom. Um, and then you can always unmute yourself if you'd like to speak. Uh, also, you can hold down the space bar if you'd like to speak for temporarily, like a walkie-talkie. Um, remember that you're on camera. Be present and smile. Very, a lot um, of times people forget they're on camera. It's like the when you're in the car paper, and, and you're feeling itchy, like so you want to scratch something like this, but you look over, the next person's picking their nose. You know, Everything happens on the camera. Remember that you're on camera. The way you smile, the way you present yourself, really reflects how your, your, your presence is going to be. Zoom is interesting because it shows everything that's going on. You might not notice, but the things behind you are showing up on Zoom. So you might want to have a clear space behind you. The things I have seen, people leave personal photos out, or people think they could only wear a shirt and, and, under, and, and <coughs> underpants or a sweatpants, or, and then the, the FedEx comes and buzzes the door and you get up quickly and you forget. Remember, you're on camera. You gotta be present and smile. If you don't feel like being on camera, no one's obligating you to. You can always click the stop video option as we saw before. Um, and it'll show your name or your icon. If you need to step away, turn off your camera. Trust me, it's worth it that you take the two extra seconds to turn off your camera and then step away and mute yourself because you never know what's gonna get picked up. Um, I helped co-host the last Hazak um, online session we did and the things I had heard from other people, it's, it's, it's awkward and it's embarrassing and it, it frankly gets rude sometimes. So always remember to mute yourself and turn off your camera if you're gonna step away. Um, if you can't hear, point to your ear. I can't hear what's going on. Is it me? Is it that I choose the wrong speakers? Did I, should I put in some headphones? Some, sometimes if you put in the headphones into the headphone jack and you put it on, It'll select it for you as the automatic um, audio source. Or sometimes a speaker doesn't realize that they have not chosen the mic right microphone. It's always nice to give a visual cue when something's going awry. And don't be afraid to meet on Zoom with friends. I like to make myself a schedule. These days, some of us are afraid to go out. Some of us are, um, just don't have time to meet each other in person or maybe transportation is spotty. So make a meeting on Zoom with friends. Hello? You might want to get yourself a cup of coffee and make a coffee date online. Hello? Maybe play a game of, of chess or something you can play with friends, some sort of game. Or just meet up with people to connect or reach out to a long lost acquaintance. Zoom is really easy because you can schedule time, you can meet with people, you can practice and really build on relationships, especially now because everyone, mostly everyone's got it. You can meet people that are across the country. I mean, that's been the wonderful thing about COVID is um, there are some silver linings, is that it's really encouraged us to have Zooming simchas, Zooming events and occasions with each other. And not only can we have people in person, but we could have people from across the country. Oh, we did have some. Um, it was really nice. My grandfather, Herb Bieber Oliver Shalom, passed away during the first couple of months of COVID. Um, and we only were allowed 10 people graveside. 
and we really had to choose family carefully. It was really, it was hard, but at the same time, I was able to put the whole service on Zoom and have cousins who wouldn't be able to be there normally, friends and cousins and acquaintances who would never even have known that this, this, this moment was happening. I could have had, to, had them on Zoom, everyone could have joined us. And that was a wonderful, wonderful- It is afternoon. Wonderful way of sharing his lifetime with, with friends and family. Yeah. So, how are we doing on time? Yeah, pretty good, yeah. Um, one thing I want to, so the next topic we're going to talk about, everyone, everyone good so far? It's okay? I know we're going, I kind of get uh, carried away. Yes. What's your name? Jerry. Yes. Yes. Zoom oh, is for the rain. Is it rain? Yeah. <laughs> right. Jerry Rabo says that Zoom is free. It has a the free version. I'm getting question. How do you Zoom with with friends? Um, that is a great question. Um, the website is www.zoom.com. Um, you can make a free account with an email. All you got to do is put your email in, um, and then. Okay, thank you, Joyce. Um, this is a good way to practice. We want to mute everyone who's not speaking. So if you're not muted, you want to go and click the little microphone icon, like we discussed in the final. You muted everyone. Good. Thank you. Um, Esther, one second. Yeah, I understand that. Okay. If you have an email address, you can make a Zoom account. Um, and when you make the Zoom account, you go to www.zoom.us. It gives you an option to log in or sign up. And under sign up, it lets you put in your email address and a password. You can make an account. It's free. Um, Zoom accounts have a 40-minute cap which is really wonderful. It's just enough time for a brief conversation with friends and family. It is just enough time to get out of any awkward conversations you have with people that you get in as well. Um, oh, look, oh, someone's at the door. I gotta go, goodbye, boop. Um, um, and it, um, it's terribly easy. So you sign in and then you say, meet now. And it'll give you a number and it say invite. And you click on invite and you can put in the email address of your friends you want to join um and then you know send it to you know rabbi feinstein at vbs.org right and then it invites your friends you might want to give them a phone call first to let them know you're inviting them because some people don't aren't connected to their phones and don't check their email quite often but you could even tell your friends here i'm meeting you and the number is because all zoom conversations have a number associated with them it's between like eight and 10 characters, nine, nine and 10, nine and 11 characters and, and numbers. And so it's easy to give them the number and they can join you. It's not terribly hard. If you'd like to practice, we can make time to practice together. That's an invitation to all of you. Um, and why is Zoom better than Skype, Esther? Skype is an older platform. It was designed by Windows when there wasn't much of a big demand for um, doing virtual meetings. Um, it's, it's, uh, so the functionality of Skype is quite limited. Um, also, it makes you log into a Windows account, which can get complicated. Also, the servers that are being housed by, by Microsoft that run Skype are being outdated because they're switching, I'm sorry, because they're switching over to um, to, uh, to Microsoft uh, Teams. And so Skype is start starting to go on its way out. It is, I would not recommend it because it's overly complicated to set up. It never quite works well for me, and I'm a tech enthusiast. Zoom is really easy. Zoom was built in a time um, when the demand for online video sharing, video conferencing, video phones was really necessary. So they've, they've learned from the mistakes of Skype and fine-tune the system to work on both newer and older machines. It really adapts quite well, and it's free to set up, and it's very, very quick and easy. 
So I would suggest Zoom over Skype any day. There are other platforms too. Google's got one called Meet. I use Zoom, I use Meet sometimes too. There's a dozen others out there and it's fun to play, uh, play with them. The one feature on Google Meet that I really enjoy is that it, that it does automatic closed captioning. Um, there is a trick to use Google Meet within Zoom in order to show closed captioning for friends who are um, hard of hearing or auto ch audio challenged, but that's, um, that's way down the road. That's a power trick we'll learn together. So let's first, let's work on Zoom together. We'll practice together. Um, uh, could it, uh, any more questions about Zoom before we move on? In the chat, no? Okay, red flags. So my bubby, Jerry Bieber, she lives in Westwood. She comes here often for services. Some of you might know her, um, gets, gets emails. Not just her, but like the office staff, everyone gets these crazy emails that are enticing and confusing. Even my mother gets these emails. I get calls every day. Is this real? Is this what's going on? I don't know. Who's calling me? Who's emailing me? So um, I get these crazy emails that come in even to myself about fraudulent emails um, and, and different situations. Sorry, I'm talking the microphone. I'm used to uh, talking, projecting without the microphone, so I apologize. Um, so we're going to look at some five safety tips. Um, so number one out of five, if the sending company is big enough to have its own marketing department and the email has grammar errors, right? So Google, eBay, Walmart, if it's big enough to be able to spell check its own emails and you see e it, grammatical errors or spelling mistakes in the email, beware, right? Here's an example, right? I don't know if everyone can see this. It says it's sent from a trusted sender, but it's not, that's fake. Hello, Yona F at gmail.com. We regret that you had a bad experience with our services last week, no period. Chase recognizes the effect of this incident on the community. We deserve to be a responsible member of this community. It doesn't make sense grammatically. It's like Chase would never write this in such a confusing way, right? Also, they, if Chase is my bank and they call me Yona F, that is a red flag too. They should know my name. I give them money. They have my social security number. They should know my name. This is a huge red flag. Like our way of saying sorry, accept this $100 voucher to use the next time on your payment. Grammatically awkward, right? It's fake. The next one. This is fun. Number two, if the sender has an email that's not associated with the company that it is presumably reaching out to you, that's a red flag. So if you get an email from, I don't know, MetLife, and the email's from something else that's not MetLife, right? Uh, we got a spam email from Rabbi Valley Beth Shalom. Uh, administration at gmail.com. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. This is someone trying to scam us, right? Here, I got one from Walmart. Notice how the email is dot Walmart. It's hard to see, but it's there. I'll zoom in a little bit. Here, dot Walmart from God. I can't even read this. At Aldo Dog. It's, it's not Walmart. It's not Walmart. You click on the email address. If you click on the email address, it'll pop down to what the longer email address is. It's definitely not dot Walmart. That's how I know this email is fake. See, honestly, don't, they don't really want to send me right rewards. Yeah, I'm gonna come up to show you if you hover over that um, yeah. click on, then you actually will see who it is. Yeah, if you hover or you click on it. So that's a way of finding out. Right, this is, this is Apple Mail, but it works the same way in Google. It works the same way in AOL. It works the same way in Hotmail. Or I can go on, there's lots of different services. They all work the same way. If you hover over it, or if you just take two seconds and hover the mouse pointer over it, or you click on it, it'll show you what the full email address is. Anything that makes you question just 2%, just is this legitimate? Hover over the email address. 
and never, never open the link. If your best judgment says something is wrong, 2%, something is wrong, don't oh, click on the link, don't respond, okay? Number three, if it's too good to be true, no, there's no Nigerian prince who wants to give you money. This happens all the time. I have investments all over the place. I have investments with friends of open startups. I've got investments in banks and mutual funds. Berkshire Hathaway knows me quite well um, with E-Trade and with uh, Morgan Stanley. Um, but I don't have money out there in Nigeria. I don't. Here. Uh, hello, how are you? Mrs. Amelia Kennedy gave me your contact and asked me to contact you before she died. She is donating some 15.5 million for your, to help her set up a charity. No, I don't know. I knew an Amelia from college, but it wasn't Amelia Kennedy. Um, no one wants to give me 15.5 million. Plus, if they're giving away this much money, they need to have a marketing department too. They should be able to check grammar. Um, from Peter Simmons. I don't know what Peter Simmons, this is ridiculous. If it's too good to be true, then it's probably not. If they really want to give you money, it, this much money, they will reach out to you by phone and by mail. They will show up at your house for $15.5 million, right? No one wants to give you money. Hopefully you guys are all doing okay financially. I'm not going to judge, whatever. But no one wants to give you that much money, okay? If they say, don't call me. It was, uh, you know, if it was 1.5 million, it would have been okay? We'll see. <laughs> Okay. Do you have 1.5 million you want to give me? No. no. If they say, don't call me, it's me, I promise. Trust me, just send me the money. Right? This happens to people all the time. Um, this happens more on phone calls than it does on email. Um, my bubby got a call from someone saying, it's your grandson. And she said, oh, it's Rafi, which is my brother. Um, and, and you just gave them information. If they don't say, hey, Bobby, it's me, Yona, or it's your cousin, so-and-so, if don't, you can't respond. And if they especially say, don't call me back, I won't be able to respond. Just send me the cards or the money wire or the transfer. No, if they really want money from you, show up at my door, right? You know, have your grandchildren come and see you if they really want the money. Yeah? Yona? Yes. Is it okay? Okay, I'm so sorry. Yes, I seem to be speaking more than anyone. So I recently won $100 for answering a survey for PC Mag. And, but, but, wait a minute, wait. So I said to myself, oh my God. And they said, this is, this is genuine. This is, blah, blah. so I thought, oh no, but I know that I did the survey. I did it. So what I did was I went back into the email because I kept that one and read their, their entire thing with the legal thing and the names of the people and it was genuine and I got my $100 and Good. I used it. Sometimes so, that works, yes. Yeah. But I would not count on that often. Yes, sir. Yeah. Norman here. Uh, I've, uh, I've had a couple of calls from people who claim to be my grandson. Problem is I have two granddaughters but no grandsons. So uh, that was pretty easy to... Maybe <laughs> That's wonderful, yes. I was going to say, um, I got an email recently from Bank of America, and one thing, it looked genuine, and they had a phone number to call, but the, no, but uh, the way to check it is to call the company, in this case B of A, with an, another independent number, yes. you know, that they publish on their statements and stuff. So I went that way, that route, to find out if it was a genuine email, and it turns out it was. Um, but I would recommend that, go to an yes. independent number. That's a great tip. I was going to get to that. Very good. You get one good uh, star. One suggestion is that before you even open it, that you click on the thing that says spam, so that that email goes into spam, and that guarantees that anything you click on, that you actually won't be able to click on any of that. And then if you think it's legitimate, you can always put it back in your, in your inbox. Right. Uh, but I don't think you should even open something that looks suspicious. And then the other, the other thing is, I got one that almost looked realistic. It's from Amazon, 
And he said, is this one of your purchases? And he showed the receipt. And you are tempted to say, look at the receipt, and it was John Smith or something. You are tempted to say no, to click no, you know, and you shouldn't be clicking on any of that. So oh, yeah. beware, some of those things are really tricky. But I think the main point is that put something in spam uh, first, and then you can open it. Yeah. Louise, yes? If you listed a fixed up a list of do's and don'ts for seniors, that would be a tremendous help because then they could keep it beside their computers and not answer. For sure. I'll I'll what I'll do is I'll make a list of do's and don'ts and I'll send it to Bill and Joel and they can send it out to their mailing list for Hazak. How does that work? Yes. Right? Yes, sir. Yep. Yep. I'm just uh, I'm just Curious, and I understand that uh, not to uh, do this uh, yeah. directly, uh, but I'm curious as to what they do with the information. Assuming somebody's do with asking you for money, it's obvious that you have to be much more careful. But let's just assuming that they just want your name or extra information. Why? Why do they want? That information. What can they do with that? Yeah. Um, with your name, name and birthday, or name and maybe a password, uh, we can spoof email addresses and then use that information to trick other people. So it comes from more, it sounds like a more legitimate source. You can open up credit card accounts. Sometimes they ask you to do um, have a social security number for a credit card. But sometimes all they need is an address, right? A real name and an address that they, if they click on the real name, it'll come up with you know, results in the yellow pages. Um, it, get, it gets, it's, it's gross to be honest, tell you the things that can come up with. Um, but some services, some services only require a name and a mailing address or a name and a birthday. And next thing you know, all sorts of places can assign credit to that um even last four of a credit card in a name or last four of a social in a name um it's the things that you can come up with with that are, are kind of disturbing I'll be, I'll be totally honest with you i've seen crazy things one last one also if they ask to be paid in gift cards huge red flag you can't trace gift cards once it's cashed out it's done you're out of your money by transferring the money from credit card or cash to gift card, you pay them with that information, it's gone. Only give gift cards to your grandchildren and family for Hanukkah or Christmas or, or, or whatever for no rules, right? This, but, ha this happened recently to one of our members of our community. Uh, the woman gave like $20,000 in gift cards. She had to go out and buy them, Amazon cards and this and that. And, delivered them before she thought maybe this isn't right. One of her kids tried to stop it, but it had already happened. Mm -hmm. So this is real. And if this Don't happens, do it. <laughs> if you get a suspicious email and you think about going through with it and you got two seconds to think maybe, maybe I shouldn't do it. If you get a suspicious email, e email me. Uh, and yeah, email me. I'll, my email address is at the mm -hmm. end. You can email me and let me know that you've got questions about such and such email. If you want to take a picture with your phone and send it to me, I'll let you know right away if it's legitimate or not. My mom does this all the time. I get like 20 emails from my mom a day about, is this a legitimate email? I get more than 100 spam every single day. How do you unsubscribe without then giving them information? What do you do to get rid of them? There's the, so the question of what to do with illegitimate emails, spam emails, fraudulent emails, um, it's funny. If it says unsubscribe at the bottom, don't click that. You'll give them your email address, and they, then they know, one, you're responding to it, you're actually a real person, and two, then they have your email address, and they could use that. Just like you can spoof a caller ID now, you're gonna get, it's, it'll say it's calling from Amazon, but it's really, it's, they say it's calling from Amazon, but it's really not them, or it's calling from Nissan dealership, right? Anyone else get the, um, the extended warranty calls these days? Oh. Oh, yeah, 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 we get extended warranty. I get extended warranty calls all the time. 
And every time I get one, I write down the phone number, and then I call Nissan Corporate and say, these are the numbers that are trying to pretend to be you. And they've actually gone after them. That's been really helpful. Right. There, yeah. So um, don't, if you unsubscribe, it lets you know, it lets them know that you're there. Um, for the most part, most email services will figure out what you're deleting on a regular basis and create some sort of pattern recognition. Um, it's a really, it's a catch-22. It really is a catch-22 because you want to get rid of these things. Um, there are ways in certain email programs to tell them what email addresses or what email suffixes at ESPN, at uh, Hallmark, at, at whatever to look for that might be more fraudulent than others. Uh, Google's got a tricky, got an easy way of doing this, but it's, um, it's more of a power tool, but maybe I can write up a guide for that. Um, it's, it's, it's tricky. I mean, m mine go into spam, into a spam folder, and they get deleted that way. Um, if you have stuff coming into the regular inbox that's not going to spam, you like to get rid of those, we can work on some tricks together. Um, not, we don't have enough, for, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to cover that right now. Um, but, um, repeat the question. How, how do you dump it into spam? Um, sometimes if you click on it, I'm going to be very careful with my wording. You can make labels in Google. Sometimes in the Yahoo and the, in the AOL, they have check boxes next to it. You could select multiple ones at a time and then click spam or flagged or something to that extent, and you start making a pattern. Um, it's, it can get complicated with how to set it up, but I'll try to put together some sort of guide. There's so many questions like this, and I don't have time right now, but we will learn together. Uh, the last one. If they send you to a web address that looks fishy, or if you just get a weird f feeling from it, delete it. Here's an example, right? I got this one last night. 49 at pjmassey.ru, right, Russia, sends me this open the Google Docs. Now, I get documents all the time from the Google Docs, the links. My coworkers send me shopping lists, and they send me um, documentation lists and all sorts of things through Google Docs. I don't know who this is, plus it's sent to a whole bunch of other people I don't know. For a Google Docs link, I'm not going to open that. I'm just going to delete that. So far, so good. If it looks fishy for any reason, delete it. If they really want to get in touch with you, they'll find a way. Yes. Is it enough to just delete it, or should you put it in junk or spam? Uh, it's both. Yes, both and yes. Sometimes you can just delete it. Sometimes put it into spam and let spam delete it in, in 30 days as it does. Just don't click on the link. Never click on the link. Anything fishy, don't uh, subscribe, don't click on the link. Just delete it or put it in the spam folder. Um, and that's pretty much it. Any more questions? Anything about myself, about technology? Anyone yeah. watching March Madness? No? So you if doing? you have questions on Zoom, please type it into the chat room or raise your hand and uh, we'll try to unmute you. Yes, any questions? Things your grandchildren refuse to answer at this point? I like long walks on the beach at candlelit dinners. Um, yes. Uh, this Very. isn't exactly what you're talking about, but I finally convinced myself that I do have, I don't have the patience to deal with a lot of envelopes and things from bankers and brokers and financial accounts. Paper and cuts, yeah. so, um, so now they're getting all very automated and online. Yes. And I realize uh, my computer is not uh, Pentagon grade protected. Uh, so for each of them, I decided it's worth 30 seconds to opt into a second identification factor. So when I go into my Bank of America account and, and type in my password, I don't connect 
to Bank of America, they call my cell phone and, I, and send me a quick uh, right. six-digit code, and I'm just ready to type in those six numbers. Jerry, that's, that's a 30 good point. seconds delay, but it means that even somebody who knows or has gotten my password uh, can't get into my bank account. That's a great, that's a great point, Jerry. Um, Jerry's pointing, pointing out a great feature now that websites do called two-factor authentication. It takes a personal device that is owned by you, and they'll either send you a text message or a phone call and read you a code, and you put that code into the website after putting in your email address and password. Um, it, it gives you a couple more seconds to vet if this is really a legitimate website. To go back to your point, uh, what's your name? Yes, Lena. Lena, um, you mentioned calling the company up directly, which is great. Exactly. Don't use the number on the email. If you get an email from Chase or from Washington Mutual or from Kaiser and they say, please give us your email and password, to correct this weird account error, call them up directly. Go on to. We go, have a question on Zoom. Well, yeah, go on to the corporate website, type in kaiser.com or chase.com, go into there, go to the customer service page. At the bottom, it'll have a phone number and call them to v verify that that's a legitimate question they're sending you. Yes, Robin. Or you have a question, I'm going to repeat it. So ask your question and then I will uh, repeat it for everyone in the room. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Oh, uh, <clears throat> on this telephone call about grandchild grandchildren, I think you should emphasize the fact that <clears throat> what they want you to do is use the name of the grandchild so that they pick up on it and use it against you. We've received a phone call it happened that we had a grandchild overseas and we say, oh, what's your name? And we never got the right answer at all. So we knew it was hokum right there. So okay, they, so they what were, he was saying is that to emphasize that they must say your grandchild's name? Yes, do not ask if, it. If do you not these... ask them, do not give them the name, ask them the name. Right. Do Even not, that, if you get a call from your grandchild or some relative that says, hey, I'm stuck in so-and-so jail, send me money, hang up the phone and call them directly. Say, you know what, I'm getting, so, it, yeah, hang up the phone and call them directly. Chances are they're not. This happens once in a while. My good friend Stephanie got a call from a friend who was mugged in Mexico. She was on a, a trip with some, I think, a bachelorette party, and she got mugged in Mexico and lost her money. But she was able to call, and then once the friend called and said, hey, I'm at a Western Union, can you send me some money? She said, well, how do we know each other? You know, what was I wearing last week when we had lunch? And you vetted, you vetted the, the person out with questions, personal questions. Any, anytime you get suspicious like that, vet it out. Um, if, if you get any weird feelings, just hang up. The person will figure it out themselves. Well, you just mentioned that if the person was in jail and couldn't call. Right. You, you're kind of hung up. That works. You, you really demand the answer. Is yeah, Esther says that sometimes if you have um, family, when you get together family, set up a secret password. Right. This is these things are important, especially if you've got friends traveling, um, especially if you know that you're going to be having. Not, uh, no one really can can guess that this is going to happen to them, but if you're going to be traveling, set up a secret word with your family just in case something happens. Yes, Ted. Uh, there's something called human engineering, and what it is is a lot of the information that they get they get from Facebook, so they will get a first name. Often they'll see a, uh, uh, on Facebook uh, somebody's trip with all the grandkids, and they'll know the name of the grandkids. So my recommendation to you is be careful when you get on social media and uh, don't mention full names. Just uh, mention uh, initials or something like that. I, I completely canceled my Facebook account because it's been hacked. Oh, you know, yeah, yeah. The, Facebook is the most hacked uh, uh, media, possibly, you know, in, in all of cyberspace. 
Well, that's fine, but you've got to be careful. You know, can I? Yes, we're, um, let me unmute you. Hold on a moment. Um, I just, can I, um, yeah, one this is Mandy Berman. Audio is on computer. Can you okay. Andy, continue. Thank you. Well, w one thing I want to say, sometimes something legitimate goes into your spam account. Uh, I had, and it was for me, the, the last one was, uh, I was asking uh, Valerie Beth Shalom to send me something, and uh, they said, and when nothing happened, um, I called them and they said, oh, but we emailed you. And I said, well, I did not get the link. Please do it again. And then I found it, I found the original email in spam. So sometimes you have to do that. You have to look um, uh, for something that was totally legitimate and ends up in spam because they never, it was from yeah. a person rather than from VBS, a person that my email didn't recognize. The one other thing I want to tell you is that- yeah, One second, Sandy, let me switch the audio just a little bit so everyone can hear you a little bit better. Give me one second. And, and perhaps you could repeat that. Turn display audio. Can you turn the volume up? Well, I, I as I said, <laughs> yeah. um, a legitimate email came from Valley Beth Shalom, but it wasn't yeah. from Valley Beth Shalom. It was from an individual, and it went into my spam. And when I called back and I said, I didn't get the link, I, I can't subscribe, whatever, and they said, well, we sent it to you. I said, please send it again. And this time I was looking for the woman's name because I actually spoke to her. And then I there looked for my spam account and there it was. So sometimes something legitimate does end up in your spam account. And there's one other thing I want to mention. I have all, of course, everybody receives a, this is your grandson, all of that. But the one that was really the most uh, ingenious was my sister-in-law received a uh, and, uh, a phone call from m my son, from her nephew, and uh, and it said, and it said, this is Ross, and I need I need some. This is what happened. My car broke, whatever, and uh, please don't tell my parents. And can you wire me some money? And literally, she was going to do this, but she she didn't know how to wire the money, and <laughs> finally. And he's using the right names. You see, they can look up people. You can look up people and find who they're attached to. You can look up and find. Yeah, I've had phone calls from my my grandson Gideon, but this was her nephew. So, and she she finally called his sister and said, Jennifer, how is Ross doing? What's happening with him? And she said, Well, he's fine. Why do you ask? And she said, uh, she told her about the phone call and she said, oh my God, that was, that was really insidious. That, so you have to be so careful when somebody's asking you for money, don't respond. Yeah, yeah. that happens quite a bit. There's an echo here, one second. There's a, there you go. There's a, um, yeah, they can look up information. Um, these people are getting very, very crafty and I've gotten some crazy emails from people I went, people I supposedly went to high school with, and um, people I went to university with who are asking for money. Um, you just gotta have a conversation, ask them personal questions, and especially if they say, don't tell my parents, don't tell my friends, then you know that something's fishy's up, because I would rather have them be angry at me that I told someone that, than me just sending money frivolously out into the wild. Uh, we have another question on Zoom. And, and Sandy, yes, p sometimes legitimate emails do go into spam. It's important to check spam every once in a while. But like you said, yours was coming from VBS. Call the office. We'll figure it out some way to do it. That doesn't get into your spam folder. We have two questions on Zoom. Yes. The question. first question is, Sheila Lane asked, what do you do if your Facebook account is hacked? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, oh. That's the hard, yeah, Ted, the easy way, Ted, is, yeah, is to cancel it, to write it off and say, look, you know what, this was a good run. Um, I can take 20 minutes out of my time and to either make a new one with stronger two-factor authentication, like Jerry says, um, you can do that, 
Um, to avoid getting hacked, one, change your password every three months, write it down in a journal, or write your passwords down on an address book. I got my mom a really big one, big metric markers, write it down on them. Um, change your password often. If you get these messages from people that say, click on this link, I need you to help do the survey for me. I just need you to put in your email address and password for me to put it in the survey. That's suspicious, don't do that. Um, uh, if you get hacked, uh, you can reach out to customer service. It's kind of tricky. They're, they're, Facebook is not one of those, Facebook is not one of those lovey-dovey corporations that want to reach out to you and help resolve things. Unfortunately, Trader Joe's will. They'll, they'll love, they'll, they're fantastic. And some other corporations will reach out and help you resolving passwords and hacking, but Facebook isn't. So you're better off letting your friends know that you've been compromised somehow, either making a new account and posting it like crazy or just writing it off and, uh, and letting Facebook know that you've been compromised through their customer service portal. There's another question. Yes. What is the next question? Barbara and Len, go ahead. Um, we haven't had this happen. You we have a friend. Hold on one moment. Sorry. It's funny. We have to unmute the sound to do a, do a, there we go. Continue. Um, we haven't personally had this happen. We're, we're really very careful about it because we have a friend who did exactly what you described with the grandson. It was an awful situation. I was going to say that one way of dealing with this is if somebody calls you and they have all your information, you say, text what you just told to Susan, but don't tell them who Susan is. And, if, and you know that they would have that person's text number, their, their text number, their phone number, their cell number. And if they don't know, then you know that it's a fraud. That's a good point. Yeah. Somebody has their hand up. Uh, uh, port. Wait. Gene, go how, ahead. How, Gene, go ahead. How safe is the HTTPS uh, address if you want to send something? How safe is HTTPS? Yeah, um, it, it's a, it's a subjective question. It really depends. It is safer than HTTP, but it really depends what you're sending. Um, there's two ways to think about it, and this even comes to, we're not gonna get into internet of things right now. It's a great conversation to have at some point. Um, you could either live in a world where you accept that there's information flowing out there and people are gonna know things about you, and um, and you and you just have to accept that there is a level of insecurity out there, but we carry on anyway and do our best. I'm hoping you're not posting your social security number around the internet and posting your passwords places. Um, but you know, on some level, we have to be personally responsible for information and what we're sending out there. And so, on some level, you know, we, we can't live in complete naivety, thinking that everything is either super safe and secure or that nothing is safe and secure. We have to live in some sort of middle ground. Um, how safe is it? It's safe. Would I, send, would I personally send my social security number on a regular website to anyone? No. Or credit card numbers. I only put in credit card numbers and verified seller things like Amazon or Google. How safe is Zelle? Um, that is a great question. Uh, Zelle, I use Zelle sometimes. I do it through my phone. It uses two-factor authentication to verify stuff. If I'm doing it through the Chase app on my phone or through the Chase website, which makes you jump through hoops to log in in the first place, because um, they reset passwords quite often, um, then I, I trust Zelle. I do. And what's great is that if it, you're using Zelle through the Chase website or through the Chase app, through that verified provider, They'll track everything, so if there is ever an issue, you can contact Chase Customer Service to, re to rectify that. Well, we are out of time, but I know we could keep going with, uh, with so other questions. questions. Yona, thank you very, very much for uh, enlightening us today. We may invite you back, because it sounds like there are still other questions, and I think the spam stuff and the scam stuff keeps 
invent, reinventing itself. So there's always something new to learn. If, if you'd like to reach out to me for more questions, my email address is y, like a yo-yo, Feinstein, like the rabbi, at vbs.org. Y, Feinstein, at vbs.org. Send me questions there. I can't promise a timely response because I'm also I'm trying to fix the synagogue, synagogue technology and the day school technology and the nursery school technology and the Hebrew school technology and helping, uh, helping with the show us Institute. I'm doing a lot of things right now, but send me questions and I'll try to get back to you by the end of the week-ish and we'll figure it out together. It's always time to learn. Thank you very, very much. We can stop that recording, Robin. Um, so our next speaker will be coming up in about 10 